You know, I don't care how anyone looks at it. We all have different views about what happened in McNary County 50, 60 years ago. Some of us believe that Buford Pusser was a true legend and hero. Others have their doubts. And what I want to say here is that regardless of how you feel, when we look at this episode, which involves the investigation, I would ask everybody to think with their heads instead of their hearts. That's the only way that you get down to deciding what might have really happened in McNary County and with the death of Pauline Pusser. So at any rate, as we get into this video, just try to do that. Think with your head and make your decisions rather than with your hearts because I too was once a big fan of Buford's. Now I'm just a fan of the story as it is. So at any rate, let's cut to the chase, get to it, take a look at the investigation and see what happened there. It's Saturday morning, August 12, 1967, as word circulates around McNary County that an ambush has occurred. Sheriff Pusser has been wounded and his wife Pauline has been killed. Initially, investigators believed that the ambush occurred at a small bridge on New Hope Road in the southern part of McNary County. As law enforcement officers and investigators arrive at the suspected scene of the ambush, they have very little information to work with. All that officers know at this point is that the car has been shot up, Sheriff Pusser has been wounded, and Pauline has succumbed to her wounds. At this point, investigators have not been able to speak with Sheriff Pusser, and he has not been able to tell them of the events of that morning. As officers search for evidence around the small bridge, McNary County Deputy P.D. Plunk believes he has found a sniper's nest. However, an assessment of the scene finds no shell casings, no footprints, nothing to indicate that a sniper had ever been there. As investigators continue to assess the scene, a young Dennis Hathcock tells them that they are looking in the wrong place that the ambush had actually occurred two miles down the road near a cemetery. Hathcock had been at the bridge with Constable R.C. Matlock just minutes earlier but returned to report that he had found evidence of a shooting about two miles down the road. Upon arriving at an intersection of New Hope and Davis Yancey Roads, investigators found a number of shell casings brain matter, and a piece of scalp with bloody blonde hair. This new evidence created even more confusion for investigators as they now had two different crime scenes to vet. Shortly after the ambush, Sheriff Pusser was taken to Baptist Memorial Hospital in Memphis where he could receive better care for his injuries. While in Baptist Hospital, Buford was able to tell his chief deputy, Jim Moffitt, and TBI's Warren Jones his version of what happened the morning of the ambush. Buford would tell Moffitt and Jones about how he had received a phone call at his residence about 4 a.m. on that date. He stated that the caller told him that there was a disturbance at Hollis Jordan's place on Highway 45. He said that as he was preparing to leave, Pauline insisted on going as due to earlier threats, she was afraid for Buford to go out into the county alone. Buford went on to tell investigators that instead of taking Highway 64 and 45, he took a shortcut that took him through Stantonville, Mickey, down to New Hope Road, where he intended to go on to Hollis Jordan's place on Highway 45, about a mile north of the state line. Buford would tell investigators and newspaper reporters alike how as they passed the New Hope Methodist Church, Pauline would say what a beautiful day it was. A little hard to believe since it was only 4.45 in the morning and the sun had not risen yet. Buford would tell how as he slowed to navigate a narrow bridge on New Hope Road, 
A blue Cadillac pulled up beside him, turned on its headlights, and gunfire started. Buford would describe how Pauline was only wounded at the first ambush by one of two shots that were fired, how that she would lean over into him, grab him by the arm while gasping for breath. According to Buford, she was still alive at this time. As shots were fired, Sheriff Pesser hit the gas in order to accelerate and lose the ambush party. He didn't stop until he got to Davis Yancey Road. The McNary County Sheriff would describe how as he arrived at Davis Yancey Road, he stopped to check on Pauline. He opened his car door, put his left foot out on the ground, his right foot still inside the car. The Cadillac pulled up beside him again, stopped. The barrel of a carbine came out the window. Shots were fired. Buford said he was hit, fell to the floorboard. Shots continued, Pauline was hit a second time, and that's when she was killed. Pusser would next claim that after laying in the floorboard for some time, he reached up, grabbed the steering wheel, pulled himself back up into the driver's seat. He looked to his left and saw the Cadillac was still there. The carbine again came out the window. Buford grabbed the barrel of the gun and held on until the Cadillac sped away. At this point, he started his car, drove to Highway 45, turned right, and drove into Eastview where he stopped at Alan McCoy's store where he and Pauline were found. The morning of the ambush, investigators were confused by what they saw and what they didn't see. Then when they heard Pusser's story, it became even more confusing for them. This is where it gets a little tricky. This is why I say that you have to look at things with your head rather than your heart. It's easy to listen to Buford's story and want to go along with it, but when you examine the evidence and it doesn't match his story, something's wrong. It was an odd set of circumstances. The evidence that investigators were seeing did not match the things that Buford was saying. The evidence just didn't seem to add up. Several people were there with investigators that day. This included District Attorney Will Terry Abernathy. Do you remember how Pauline's daughter Diane Vance had described Buford as carrying Pauline to the car and then coming back toward the house, picking up her shoes and placing them in the floorboard of the passenger's front seat. The shoes have the appearance of having been placed there rather than having been slipped off by Pauline. Then there was the blood on the passenger's door, the void in the middle of that, where there was hardly any blood at all as if Pauline's head had laid there and blocked any spatter from getting on that portion of the door. This blood pattern did not match Buford's description of how Pauline was shot a second time at the second ambush site. Here, Will Terry Abernathy looks at the blood spatter on the hood of the car. Buford had told investigators that neither he nor Pauline exited the vehicle at any time. Yet, as you can see, there's blood spatter all over the hood of the car and elsewhere on the vehicle. Investigators also took a close look at the location of shell casings at the second ambush scene. They did not match what one would have expected to find from the story that Buford told about the shooting. The bullet trajectories were also a telltale sign of Buford telling a lie. They were more consistent with someone on foot firing into the car rather than sitting in a vehicle next to him and firing into the car. Notice the two separate bullet holes in the door post right behind where Buford's head would have been. Buford was a huge man, yet the shooter sitting 
no more than five feet away, could hit Pauline a second time, hit the dash, hit the windshield, hit the door post twice, the window behind Buford's, but yet only managed to hit Buford in the chin. It's almost like the two holes in the door post were meant to convince people that Buford was the target. Then there is the brain matter that had the appearance of having been stacked on the side of the road. County Coroner Ward Moore and past and future Sheriff Clifford Coleman agreed that this looked very odd. Investigators began to question why that Buford would take a route that took him through Stantonville, Mickey, down New Hope Road if he were trying to get to Hollis Jordan's beer tavern on Highway 45, when a much faster route would have been to take Highway 64 into Selmer, turn left on 45, and then go to Hollis Jordan's. As investigators looked at the crime scenes, the first ambush site, the second ambush site, and Buford's car, it, where that they were found in Eastview, they began to have questions when they compared the evidence to the story that Buford had told other investigators. One thing that caught investigators' attention was Carl Pusser's story that a call came in around 2 a.m. about a disturbance at Hollis Jordan's Beer Tavern, but Carl never sent anyone out to answer that disturbance complaint. Now the second thing is, what would have made an ambush party believe that it would be Buford that answered the call rather than one of his deputies? When the party of assassins realized that Carl Pusser was not going to dispatch Buford, they made a call to his residence. Buford got up, was planning to respond, and according to him, Pauline insisted on going with him because of several threats that were alleged to have been made against his life. She was afraid for him to be alone at night, especially in that part of the county. Pusser alleged that he had been receiving calls approximately four weeks before the ambush, warning him that he should not answer calls alone in that part of the county, that he would be stalked and killed. Now when you look at this, you have to wonder, what kind of assassin calls his intended victim and warns him that he's going to be killed? Was Buford trying to set up a story for a later crime? As shown here, one of Buford's deputies would say that Pauline often accompanied Buford on such calls so he wouldn't be out alone. However, his chief deputy, Jim Moffat, disputed this, saying that if there was a call late at night that Buford was to go out on, he would always contact Jim, and Jim would be the one to go with him. Another thing that seemed somewhat suspicious to investigators was the fact that only Pauline and Buford knew the nature of the call that they were going on. Another thing that's important to point out is that the call to the Pusser residence didn't come in till just shortly before 4 a.m. There were several things about Buford's story that disturbed some of the investigators. For instance, the fact that only he knew of the threat that he was to be stalked and killed, especially in that part of the county. And by that part of the county, I mean close to the state line. Also disturbing to investigators was the fact that even knowing this threat, that he would allow his wife to go with him on a call at night. Beyond that, there's also the fact that Jim Moffat disputed the story that Pauline often accompanied Buford on such calls. Moffat would say that if there was a call at night that was to be answered, Buford would contact him and Jim would go on the call with him, not Pauline. Then there's also situation where that Buford chose to take a convoluted combination of back roads to get to Hollis Jordan's place on Highway 45, a mile north of the state line, when he could have taken Highway 64 and 45 and been there much quicker. Even though it was a little bit longer route, the roads were so much better. But one of the things that really caught some of the investigators was the fact that Buford said that the car that was used in the alleged attack 
was a dark colored Cadillac, one that matched a car that W.O. Hathcock had owned. The only thing is, Hathcock had sold that car weeks earlier to a dealership in Tupelo, Mississippi. He no longer had that car. Was Buford trying to set W.O. up for his wife's death? I'm told that W.O. and Larice Hathcock were so concerned that Buford might try to frame them for Pauline's death that they voluntarily took polygraph examinations to prove themselves innocent. The general consensus among many of the investigators that morning was that Buford was lying about the ambush, the way that it happened. But if that were not bad enough, now things were about to take a turn for the worst as they learned that there would be no autopsy on Pauline. An autopsy is generally performed by a team of pathologists and autopsy technicians. An autopsy is important in today's investigations. Now, not only can it establish a cause of death, but it can establish the time of death, angle of projectiles, like in this case, bullets as they struck Pauline, the height of the weapon being fired, the distance from the victim, and there's so much more, like defensive wounds that can be located and identified signs of previous physical abuse, and today we even have the ability to recover DNA from an assailant. I was so curious regarding why an autopsy was not performed on Pauline that I contacted state medical examiner Jerry Francisco, who actually participated in the previous autopsy of Louise Hathcock. Dr. Francisco explained that while in 1966 he had received a request to have an autopsy done on Louise Hathcock, he had not had a similar request to made for his office to do an autopsy on Pauline Pusser. He went on to explain the protocols for requesting an autopsy. He explained that the local medical examiner, in this case Harry Peeler, and the local DA, which would have been Will Terry Abernathy, had to concur on the need for an autopsy. For some reason, they did it with Louise Hathcock. However, when it came to Sheriff Pusser's wife, Pauline, one or both of them did not want an autopsy performed. Now the question is that everyone seems to have on their mind is, did politics become involved in this investigation? I mean, did Harry Peeler, the local medical examiner, want to have an autopsy done on Pauline? What about Will Terry Abernathy? Those two men had to agree and concur on the need for an autopsy. Obviously, one or both of them did not want an autopsy performed on Pauline. The question is why? Why would you do one on Louise Hathcock, a bar owner, and not do one on a sheriff's wife. That makes no sense at all. And then, of course, there's Ray Blanton, the U.S. representative that's from Adamsville, just like Buford. They were friends. As a matter of fact, when Blanton ran for governor as a Democrat, Buford, a Republican, campaigned for him. So, you tell me, was there politics involved? You know, in the movie Walking Tall, it showed that the state liners had all the political pull through a guy named John Witter, a fictional character in the movie. You know, it seems like everything is upside down. At any rate, that's where we'll take up next week with this series, and we'll talk about political connections and get into more of the investigation as we do part two. See you then.